thanks again for being with us today. Uh, in the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about hemp production in the regenerative organic agriculture system. My name is Arash Khadgola Behpahani. I'm the director of research at Rodale Institute, Pocono Organic Center. And with me today, we have Dinesh Pandey, who is a soil scientist uh, and a, another researcher at Rodale Institute. He helped me to uh, conduct this uh, presentation today on different type of hemp. Also, other than us from Rodin Institute, we have uh, Dr. Irene Dovey, who is an entomologist that say, she will say a few words on pest management in uh, hemp fields. And also we have Nariman Khatamian, who is a master's student in the field of paper engineering. He is a paper engineer. In the, at the University of Applied Science uh, in Munich, Germany. And he's going to talk about fiber hemp uh, or fiber quality produced from hemp. So uh, before I start my presentation, I want to use this opportunity to talk about the center, introduce the center to you. Rodale Institute Pocono Organic Center is a research center that established through collaboration between two organization. First, Rodel Institute, which is a nonprofit organization with a great mission of generating and spreading information on organic agriculture between the community of organic producers and uh, agriculturalists in general. And Pocono Organic is a profit organization located in, uh, at the Pocono Mountain in Pennsylvania also. Pocono Organic is the world's first regenerative organic certified hemp field, which we are really proud of that. And also one of the largest uh, certified regenerative organic field in the world. Two, days, two years ago, almost two years ago, when we established this center, when I joined Rodale team, we developed a scope of work for the center and we decided to work specifically on hemp studies and specialty crops. Like other than hemp, we work on uh, other very special crops like saffron, vegetables in different type of agroecosystem. We conduct integrated pest management studies through collaboration with other research institutes and universities also. Okay, so other than like this, uh, event, we conduct uh, educational events at the center. And uh, in the research area that we have access to, we have access to 25 acre acres of solar field that gives us a great opportunity to conduct agrivoltaic studies here. And the last component of a scope of work here is precision agriculture studies, which is about introducing technology to uh, agriculture sectors, which are well known as low tech section. We are trying to make the technology uh, more user friendly for growers that they are not essentially able to do programming, this kind of thing. So we are trying to uh, bring those technology to the studies. I'm not going to talk about all the components here today or focus will be on hemp, but in the future, if we have time, another workshop or webinar, we will talk about. So another thing that I want to mention here is like OMRI website. I want to show what that one is because you may hear this term again, again and again today. So OMRI stands for Organic Material Review Institute, which they have a website and uh, for us, when we want to use some products that like fungicide or fertilizer in organic agro ecosystem, and we want to know, are we allowed to use that product in uh, organic agriculture? We go to their website. They have a search engine in their website. We search the name of the product. For example, I search Mila stock is a fungicide. It's actually potassium bicarbonate. And if the product is listed there, that means I'm uh, allowed to use it in uh, my organic field. So 
If you are not familiar with uh, OMRI website, please go there, educate yourself. Lots of cool information in the website. You also can download the certification of the products that uh, you want to use in your field and those kind of paper and document paperwork and documents you need that for your certification. Okay, now is the time to talk about cannabis sativa, hemp. So for a long time, when we say, said cannabis sativa to people, they felt like, oh, it's marijuana, which is true or wrong. So I want to write a sentence from a paper that was published in 2016 in the Agronomy Journal. I just found this piece of information today. They said that the 1970 act did create a distinction between marijuana and hemp. Previously, they were like similar term. But what is the difference between marijuana and hemp? They both are from one species, cannabis sativa. They are subspecies, varieties, or whatever, chemotype. But the difference is like when you have cannabis sativa plant with a, con with a concentration, high concentration of a psychoactive component. The name of that component is delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol well known as TAC is the thing is a chemical that uh, makes people high when they smoke it. So when the concentration of that chemical component is more than 0.3%, the cannabis that you have is marijuana or defined as marijuana. But when the concentration of that component is low, and instead of that, you have nine non-psychoactive component concentration high, like CBD, CBG, then the product that you have is hemp. So keep that number in your mind, 0.3%. We need it later. Cannabis sativa is one of the earliest domesticated plant uh, between all the crops that we have. So every single part of this plant can be used for something, for industrial sectors, for like flower can be used for pharmaceutical sections. Fiber can be used for many, many things. Seed is like has or contains a high level of proteins. Even the root system can be used for lots of things. Even phytoremediation, extracting heavy metals from the uh, contaminated soil can be done by this plant. So more than thousand and thousand uses has been, uh, have been reported on this plant. It's amazing and we, talk about every single part of that later today. I know that this slide, I brought this slide from one of the presentation that Dr. Pandey presented somewhere else. I want to, I know this slide is his favorite. I know you, Dr. Pandey, if you hear me, just say a few words about this slide. Yeah, thank you, Aras. So H. Aras mentioned that uh, many parts of hemp can be used for many purposes. So in that purpose, uh, in 1941, Henry Ford, who is the founder of the Ford company, so they started uh, going with the sustainability concept. And then uh, at that time, the gasoline was highly used. And then what we can bring is a green energy. And they thought with the idea of the hemp, that means hemp is mixed with other uh, materials, for example, this uh, material here is that uh, it is mixed with a uh, fiberglass. Uh, uh, th th this hemp uh, was mixed with a uh, wheat and spruce pulp, which made the car 10 times stronger or tougher than the steel. So in this car particularly, other than the car's tubular welded frame, everything was mixed with hemp materials and that becomes the 10 times tougher. So this is one of the very good example that uh, the car, what we have right now in the US are those that are like a kind of a heavy car, heavy weighted, and then they have like a low fuel efficiency. So for that reasons, what we can do as an alternative approach is that uh, can we develop any car products or materials that can be tougher and then lighter in a weight and also maybe more fuel efficiency. In that purpose, Henry Ford came with an idea using the hemp materials to build the car materials. Great, thank, thank, thank you, Dinesh. And you always finish this slide with saying why we don't have cars 
made by hemp right now in the U.S. I don't know if we have them or no, but right. I think, uh, yeah, let me finish that part very shortly that uh, that time the somehow the gasoline price went down and then also there was some ban in the hemp. So that is the reason that this study did not go um, or did not move forward. In general, recent days we are talking about three types of hemp. One is grain hemp or seed hemp that is mostly produced to harvest the seeds and seeds are good source of nutritious food technically with a high concentration of proteins. Another type of hemp that we plant them is like fiber hemp that we plant them for long fiber, which is well known as best and herd. And uh, the second, the third category is like CBD hemp, which we plant them to produce tinctures to extract CBD and other chemicals as secondary metabolites to produce different type of pro uh, products, value added products, like tinctures with like soap that can be used for pharmaceutical or other parts. So, we, we will talk about, specifically today, we will talk about fiber hemp and CBD hemp, mostly on CBD hemp. The focus will be on CBD hemp, but in the future, uh, and one of the events that we have in August, we will talk about uh, seed hemp also. The main focus will be today on production of this crop in the field. So in organic agriculture, like conventional, we first of all, we need to have some general idea about the optimum situation to produce these plants. Like what is the best soil situation? How much fertilizer we need? What time is the best time for planting uh, this plant? Those are the basic questions that grower face or have to answer when they want to start producing this crop. So it is reported that uh, hemp likes drain soil. The pH level should be around six to seven to produce hemp. Then uh, how about fertilizer? We know that or people published like different information in their papers, but it's like 150 tons of, uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre is the amount that most of the people reported. What is the best time to plant hemp? It depends on the area that you are. I'm not talking about California. In the Northeast region, the best time is sometime between May to early June, maybe May, June. But maybe you ask, Arash, are you talking about CBD hemp or you are talking about fiber hemp? That's a great question. Actually, producing those plants are like totally different. Same species, but the procedure for using them is like totally different. For CBD hemp, we seed the plants in the seedling room, in the seedling trays, and we produce seedlings in a month in the germination room. And then we trans transfer three weeks or one month old seedlings to the field and transplant them. At least in Pennsylvania is the way that we do. It's like we plant thousands of plants per acre. It's the density that we use. For producing CBD hemp, what we need is like, we mostly need flowers because we want to extract secondary metabolites and CBD concentration is higher in the floral part of the plant. So we want to have more flowers. So in this case, we need to terminate the male plants in the field because we don't want pollination in the field. Pollination can actually, after pollination, as you know, is like we will have seeds in the field. And when we are producing hemp to produce CBD, then we don't want it to have seeds because this system having seeds is like make the uh, process of uh, post-harvest handling more expensive and also more complicated. And also we change the chemical component in the plant. And even one male plant is able to produce, it is reported more than 300 K pollen. So if you have a plant to establish CBD hemp field, terminate the male plant is the thing. For the fiber hemp, we have a different scenario. We plant the seeds directly in the field with the grain drill, as you see that in the picture. And we plant 500 K plants to 1 million plants per acre. Just think about that density. It's like totally different from the CBD hemp. The post-harvest handling is totally different. And the purpose of planting is like different. In this case, we use the stem. In that case, we use the flower. Organic produ producers uh, usually have face lots of challenges that they need to fight with those challenges and they have to solve it. One of the 
most important problem that we have here, especially in the Northeast region is like weed management. Weed management is much easier in the conventional field because they can use pesticides, uh, herbicides, but it's not, a, it's not an option in organic agriculture. So we have to find other ways to reduce the cost of weed management and impact of those on uh, the plants. Soil fertility is like finding alternative for chemicals to increase the soil fertility is another part of the challenge. Pest management, disease management is another challenge that they have is like pest and disease are able to damage the plants up to 100%. So, and at the end we need to manage field and also at the same time, we need to produce the highest yield and highest quality in the field. So we need to find ways to fight those challenges and uh, for that, we established three ongoing research trials at the center. Two of them are on CBD hemp production, and one is uh, fiber hemp production. And one by one, I will discuss what we have. For trial number one, uh, we titled that weed management in regenerative organic field. So the focus of that research is application of cover crop and cover crop termination to suppress the weed in the field. And also we played with the density of planting. We, the hypothesis was like, when we have more plants per acre, the shade, the canopy that they make is like, will help us to suppress the weed. And we wanted to see which way was better, what density is better for CBD plants to be planted in the field. So for cover crop management trial, we planted cover crop and we roller crimped the cover crop. Ladies and gentlemen, the machine that you see here is roller crimper that crimps the cover crop. I should say this machine is innovated by the former CEO of the Rodale Institute. It's a thing that we proud of. We tested that. We wanted to see when we make a cover by those terminated cover crop and make a cover on the surface of the plant, are we able to suppress the weeds uh, in the hemp fields or does it help and how it affects yield and quality of CBD hemp? Uh, I have another picture to show the shape of cover crop after crimping uh, in the field, which I believe is beautiful. You see how thick the match of cover crop is on the field. So using that cover crop for no-till cropping system is amazing, but it is always challenging and time consuming to plant following crops in the place that we have the cover, right? So for that one, some machines are developed like no-till seed grain drill that you see in the right picture. And in the left picture, you see a uh, carousel seedling planter, which is a no-till seedling planter that is developed to uh, plant seedlings between those uh, uh, cover crop. So I'm not saying these machines are perfect, but we are working together to find the best way to optimize or facilitate planting uh, following crop seeds and transplant between those covers. No, let's go back to the trial that we did. So in the trial, weed management trial, we try to compare the effect of that cover crop, the mat, the roller crimped area with the area that we didn't have cover crop or we disc the cover crop, like regular conventional planting. So as two treatments, we planted some of the seedlings in the place that we had cover crop and Compare, it, uh, compare the result with the place that it didn't. So we also look at the row spacing, row of the distance between the rows of uh, planting. Uh, we use 30 inches and 60 inches as like two different spacing. And uh, we tested the plant spacing uh, in each row. We planted in each row, we kept the distance between the plants like 24 inches and we compared the result with 30, uh, four, uh, 30 inches. So, as a result, we realized that CBD hemp yield is more in the area that doesn't have a uh, cover crop. So that means roller crimping can impact the biomass, the yield of CBD hemp. But it's not all about uh, yield of crop. In organic agriculture, we're also talking about ecological services that uh, producing, uh, using cover crop and no-till cropping system can provide for us. So when you add those kind of things, you feel like, okay, 
maybe using cover crop is an option. And also, we realize that there are some challenges in application of uh, roller crimping and having cover crop and no-till cropping system in CBD hemp production. Like, oh, how we can optimize the planting way, planting method in the place that we have cover crop. We are working on that. And we hope that in the future we will have, uh, the, we, we are trying to optimize the methodology, methodology to plant seedlings in that area. We are working on that. And uh, this trial is just replicated one year in the future. Uh, this year we are duplicate that trial and uh, we are trying to optimize the planting method and uh, in the future, we will share the result with all of you. Other than uh, crimping and no-till cropping, we realize that when we keep the distance between the rows around uh, 60 inches, we get better results compared to place that we have 30 inches distance between the rows. The plants are bigger and they, they produce more biomass for us. And But the distance between the plants in each row if we set it around 24 inches, you, you will be able to produce higher yield. One thing that I forgot to tell you is like the variety that we planted uh, last year is like a uh, uh, Kirsch variety that we got and Lindora, two varieties that we tested. Uh, yeah, that's it. Other than yield, we also, oh, the thing that we did not uh, observe, we didn't see any significant differences between the concentration of uh, secondary metabolites in the plant, like CBD, CBG, THC, or other, other 10 components that we tested among treatments. So that was the reason I didn't mention, I didn't uh, bring the graphs here. So other than that, we look at the uh, weed pressure, because that trial was uh, established to look at the weed pressure. And uh, the person who worked uh, on that is Dinesh. And I hope, Dinesh, you are able to jump in and talk a few words about the thing that you observe in that part of the trial. Yeah, thank you again, Aras. As Aras mentioned, that uh, wheat management is one of the biggest challenges in the regenerative or even simply the organic agriculture. And then uh, this trial was especially focused on the wheat management. And then uh, what we are looking at here is uh, we applied uh, practice of the roller crimping versus incorporation. If you see on the left side that you will see the treatments, we have one treatment with the cover crop termination. What, how we terminate the cover crop, one is incorporation, and then next one is roller crimping. So incorporation, that means like cover crop was mixed in the soil where we till. The roller crimping was no till. And another treatment we have row to row spacing and plant to plant spacing. Those are mentioned by RS as well. Uh, the table may be a little bit difficult to understand for everyone you, but let me bring the simple version of this table is that uh, we mentioned uh, two different types of weed here, broadleaf versus grass type. We also categorize into the sage, but uh, we did not observe any sage type uh, weed in our observation. So only two different broad group of weed with a broad leaf category and grass type. The event one and event two stands for, the event one stands uh, 30 days after transplantation of uh, CBD hemp. And event two stands for 30 days before harvesting of the CBD hemp. As we harvest, the flower is very important in the CBD hemp harvesting. So event one, 30 days after transplantation, even to 30 days before uh, harvesting. What we observe here is uh, that uh, from event one to event two, in case of the broadleaf, we have seen some reduced number of the broadleaf uh, weed coverage. For example, in a roller crimping, the weed coverage has been reduced from 87.4 to 74, almost 13.8 has or 13 percentage has been reduced. Again, this is not the direct comparison, but what we are seeing the trend is uh, in even to or the later stage of the uh, plant growing stage that roller crimping is becoming effective for the domain, uh, sorry, uh, what we like a suppress of the broadleaf type weed compared to the grass weed. This is the one message from the, our first year trial. Okay, great. Th th thank you, Dinesh. Are you done? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. 
So another uh, part of the study that uh, we worked on, we look at the concentration, the correlation between the concentration of secondary metabolites that we had in the plants. And we observed like we, there is a correlation between CBD and C THC concentration. When we have CBD higher, we had more THC also. And that correlation was like positive for CBD, THC, and CBG. So I don't talk that much on that for now. After I talked uh, on the second trial, about the second trial, the nitrogen management, I will come back and talk about the value, the importance of correlation between secondary metabolites again. So trial number two was about uh, precision nitrogen management in the field. The question that we wanted to answer is like, how much nitrogen we have to apply in our organic field to produce the highest quality and also the highest yield in the field. So we had five different levels of nitrogen uh, as fertilizer uh, in the trial, zero as control, 50 pounds, 100, 150 and 200 pounds per acre, acre nitrogen we used. The source of nitrogen was blood meal, which is, a, is an OMRI listed uh, fertilizer. It looks like coffee, the shape is like coffee, but it smells really bad. So anyways, and also it's expensive, you know, it's like, uh, it's a product that we are allowed to use in our organic system. So we tested that and also we used uh, or tested two different application methods, banding that stands for just spreading fertilizer around in the line that we have plants or around the uh, area that on the, area that we have root system in the soil. And broadcasting, which is a conventional method, if you are a grower and you have a fertilizer sprayer, you go to the field and spray uh, or spread fertilizer everywhere in the field, between the rows, between the plants. It's like we tested two, two, those two methods. We, again, the question was like, what should we do? How much fertilizer we have to use and uh, what way is better? So the results show that there is a, significant correlation uh, between the amount of nitrogen that we use and uh, the dry biomass, the weight of dry biomass that we can harvest. More nitrogen, as we expected, means more yield. So, but the results show that if you are going to broadcast your uh, fertilizer, spread it everywhere, as you see in the left graph, the, the graph in the left side, uh, it's like, in that case, it's better to use 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But if you are able to use or solve your fertilizer in the water and you are able to, broad, uh, to just put fertilizer on the, root, uh, on the root system, then 150 pounds per acre nitrogen is much better. It has a higher uh, nitrogen use efficiency compared to uh, spreading the fertilizer everywhere in the field. So how about, all right, the next question is like, how about uh, concentration of CBD? We are looking for more CBD. The results show that again, when we have more nitrogen, we have more uh, CBD content in the plant. In the right side, uh, graph in the right side, you see that. You see the same trend for TAC also. But let's look at the, correlation, the model, the linear model in the left side, what you see here, the result shows that when we have more TAC or more CBD, we have more TAC. There is a strong correlation and relationship between the content of TAC and CBD. Okay, Arsh, that's great that we have more CBD, but what is the problem? The problem is, we have to switch back to the first slide I showed to you. When you have TAC more than 0.3%, then the product that you have is not hemp anymore. You produce hot hemp, in parentheses, marijuana. So in this case, USDA doesn't let you to harvest the plant. So you have to, they send the agent to your field and they ask you to terminate your plant. Last year, I saw people that they applied lots of nitrogen. That couldn't be the only reason, but it can be also. It was like, and then at the end, when the USDA tested their plants, they realized that the concentration of TAC is high 
and they had to terminate their plant and they lost thousands and thousands of dollars. This data is just for the variety that I tested. It can be different for other things, but it gives you a heads up. Be careful. More nitrogen means more yield, more CBD, but at the same time, it puts you in a risk. So just be aware about it. So now is the talk about fiber hemp, which is my favorite part. You know, it's my favorite part because, you know, or my, my favorite hemp type, because I can see the saturation point in the market for CBD, but I cannot see that for the fiber hemp. Fiber hemp, fiber hemp has a huge market lots of users we can have and we are far away from the saturation point in the market for the fiber so uh, this trial that we did uh, had a reason in pocono we are located in zone climate zone usda climate zone zone 5b in a simple language that means very cold it's the climate zone for your information we are in pennsylvania but climate zone 5 a, B is similar to the climate that we have in Vermont, in New Hampshire, okay? So the problem here is like we have a short growing season, so we are not able to plant uh, hemp too early because freezing night can kill the plants. So by the time that we pass the last freezing night here, we have a little bit of time to grow hemp and we want to achieve the highest yield and lots of varieties are like photoperiodic uh, or uh, day length sensitive plants. That means in August, when the day lengths get shorter and shorter, they produce flower. And when they produce flowers, uh, plants stop growing. So we, through this uh, trial, we wanted to produce more yield. And as I told you, lots of application for uh, fiber hemp is like in the construction material, hempcrete, those kind of things. And uh, when we produce hemp, we plant the seeds, then we go and harvest the stems in the field by sickle bore mower. Uh, and uh, we keep the stems in the field for several weeks for retting. Retting is the process, microbial process that, uh, that helps us to separate bast from herd and facilitate uh, the process of post-harvest handling to produce fiber. So we tested four different varieties of fiber hemp here in the research uh, site that we have, M77, Futura, Santica, and Honey. One of them is Australian uh, or well known as Australian. Another one, Honey, is Chinese variety and two European-based variety. We planted the, the plants in too late in the in last year, but we planted in May, June last year. This year we planted in mid-May. So at the end, the plants that we harvested, they didn't produce that much yield, but because they were planted at the same time, we were able to compare the yield at the end. And we look at the yield that they produce and biomass that they produced. And we realized that between all of those honey, uh, which is a non-photoperiodic or non-sensitive, day-length day sensitive uh, variety produce more yield. You can see the picture in the left side, you see uh, some of them got like uh, up to seven, eight feet tall when some of the varieties, they didn't get long, got longer, they didn't get longer than three feet maybe. So uh, we, we are going, because we didn't, uh, we, we, we are looking for more yield than what we observed last year. We, this year, we added different layer of treatments into this trial. We are going to use different nitrogen rate to increase the soil productivity. And also we are going to use our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. They are fungi that help plants to uh, produce more root system in the soil and absorb nutrients from the soil more and more and produce more yield as a result of that. So for years, I worked on a specialty crops and I was always thinking about the quality of a specialty crops that uh, I worked on. When we worked on the fiber hemp, that was always like my question, how about the quality of fiber? How we can define it? How we can uh, know the characteristic of fiber produced from hemp? Uh, and actually that was not my background to work on that. I started to talk with different people with different backgrounds and suddenly find found uh, the team in Germany 
uh, that there are a team of paper engineers at the University of Applied Science in Munich. And I started my interaction with Nariman to talk about uh, my project. And I told them, I have different varieties. I, I want to know which one has a better fiber and even answer this question, what is a good fiber? What is a bad fiber? And he said, just stop. Let me go through my methodology and come up with a protocol to look at the fiber characteristics and the usage and the quality through my way. So I sent some samples, old samples to Germany for him to start a, a small uh, preliminary research on that. And uh, the result that he got, I found interesting. That was the reason I invited Nariman Hotamian to join us here today. He is in Germany. It's almost the time for us flipping for him. But I'm glad that we have you here, Nariman. Uh, please take your stage and uh, let us know what you did and what you observed. Thank you. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Arash. Yeah, as Arash told you, my name is Nariman. Yeah, I'm studying uh, paper technology or paper engineering in Hochschule München in Deutsch or Munich University of Applied Science. I'm already holding a master in Mavud and paper technology. And I'm doing my second master right now, more specifically on the paper. And you may ask why Germany is so like a, the most, um, one of the, I say, one of the, or flagship of the countries in the technology, especially in the machineries. Is Germany, uh, we have a lots of big uh, companies and the well known companies in Germany that they are responsible for the producing the paper machine. And uh, they also have a, like the quite nice collaborating also with the US and the other part of the world. And this is also like a nice place to study paper technology, specifically if you're interested in the paper. The project Fiber Hemp is a collaboration of also, of course, you, the Roden Institute and HM or Hochschule München or Munich University of Applied Science. So I will start with the introduction and I will just share you like the general information about the hemp market in EU and also some uh, recent and most specifically interestingly uh in opiative uh, solution what's happening right now in the world so uh hemp market actually in the in eu is not a, like a something new back to the old days back to the 300 years ago we still can find some paper mills and specifically in germany that they were using the hemp for producing the paper these meals were just you can also uh, find that easily that they are right now, they're producing lots of materials out of the hem with a different concentration, of course. Uh, but uh, more interestingly is that and this is not something new that you can uh, make the paper out of the hem. But why we are looking forward again to redo and revise this research and the research is that I will explain the like in the fewest slide. So as you can see, um, there are some companies right now in the Germany that they are uh, in. They are using the hemp as their main one of the main stock, as a, for the pulping procedure and to making the paper. So for the more interestingly is the number one, the GMO papier or the GMO paper. They are using the high concentration of the hemp. Uh, more than ninety percent of their first stock is out of the hemp. We can see at uh, the two other names that they are uh, Defner Jonan and uh, uh, Hanomel located also in the diesel, it's uh, like the area uh, in the Germany. And they are also producing like the more paper grade that we are using like in the arts right now. And also we can see that also this market is obviously growing in the US. And uh, one of the interesting things that is happening right now in the US is the hemp food. So I just uh, like to put a picture here that is uh, like an interesting company. I just put it here because I have also the background in the wood and the processing the wood and the manufacturing of boards. Uh, for example, the MDF or the HDF. And uh, this one was just took my eyes. This is something actually very cool. You can look it out. I also put the source here. And they also have lots of interesting materials and uh, products. So, uh, this is what is uh, actually right now happening in the EU that you can see the hemp cultivation uh, and the land that which is using right now. And this 
only decreasing trend, we can disregard it that it might be due to the corona because corona situation and also the regulation in Europe was super tough and especially in Germany. And uh, as you can see, and uh, in this trend and the graph, the interesting fact is that the first uh, country which has the highest cultivation of the area that they are just putting for the hemp is the Netherlands, and surprisingly, the second one is the France, and the third one is the Poland, and uh, and afterwards, I think it's Germany. So, as Arash already uh, spoke about the legal issues and the legalization of the hemp, as you might also know, there are not much that more specifically regulation in Europe, and that's the thing. For example, in a in as you already know, in the Netherlands, there are no like. Uh, legal issue for the hemp, for the marijuana, not the hemp. And uh, so you can buy it and you can use it, but uh, it means that they cannot sue the people, but it doesn't mean that it's legal. So this is also happening in Germany and uh, it is started in the, uh, from the government to provide some, the same regulation for the Germany as well. But we are just able just for the info, but we are just talking about the hemp with the uh, concentration of the 0.3% THC. So the varieties that which was used in this uh, study was the ivory, canola, anca, and also the beech pulp, just for the control and using as a mixture. So before going through the process, so the first thing we have to do for the production of the paper is the pulping, which is the essential factor that is happening right now in the paper mills. So in the pulping, you have to delignify and just remove the lignin from the wooden parts because of the effects that the lignin have. So for just more information, lignin is acting, if you have like a wall of the bricks, the lignin act as a cement on the same wall. So one of the main uh, reasons for the pulping is to delignification and also increasing the final quality of the paper. So we, uh, in general, there are lots of methods for the pulping. The first one is a mechanical, which is like a uh, old and the conversional method. We have also the chemical pulping and the CTMP, which is uh, like the mixed pulping method. In mechanical, it, as it uh, came from its name, the removing the lignin from the cellulose and also the, uh, the fibers is happening by applying the mechanical forces and by the chemical, by using the chemical and also the pressure and the temperature. So in this research, we will just use the chemical pulping, which is called, uh, it's one of the standard methods and the process, the soda cooking on the soda pulping uh, with a concentration of the NOH. So the machine which was used to cook the hemp uh, or to pulp the hemp at the first, very first step is the digester cooker. As you can see on the left, hand side of the picture is a digester cooker. It's a just uh, keeping in mind that it's a, like a laboratory device. It's not a paper mill. And uh, there is also like the same procedure that's happening right now in a paper mill, but in a different size and the dimensions. So this machine has a, like a fixed shaft, uh, which you can see here, and also a heating component, a temperature sensor, and a cylinder, which you can seal the cylinder inside the heating component by using the washers and the bolts. So the operation condition that which we were used in this uh, research was to use 10% and the 15% of the NOH. The temperature was fixed, was on 160, the time was 120 minutes. And as a result of the uh, temperature, the pressure was increased to five to seven bar, which was fluctuating and it was quite normal. And the ratio for the pulping and the cooking was one to seven, which was the solid to liquid, as you can see. So in these two tables, you can see the amount of the chemicals and also the fibers that we were using. As I told you, it was the anka, canola, and the ivory. So for the beach, it was already prepared. So we don't have to cook the, we didn't have to cook the beach again. It was a prepared pulp. We just have to use the dispersion machine to mix it properly. And we will also use the, these uh, on the table below, you can see the mixtures that was happening, for example, we can take the uh, Anka as an example. We were using 80% of the beach and only 20% of the uh, fiber hemp. 
with a condition of the 10% AOH uh, cooking condition. And it was all happening for the other varieties as well. So uh, this is what happening actually. So the picture on the left is just a, like a hemp and the fibers just putting in the chemicals. Nothing happening right now. We just put the fibers in the chemical just for rest for two minutes or maybe five minutes. Uh, and after the cooking and after the procedure, you can see that also the very interesting things that happen in the capsule eyes is just a color that is more turning to the white. And it's because of the extraction of the lignin. And uh, this is what is the main objective of the paper making. And uh, I also just uh, quickly check the question and answer. And, it, and if it's final rush, I will do it at the end of the presentation. But just feel free to ask, uh, maybe I use some of the terminology that is not uh, common right now, but uh, I will try to explain every question that you have. After the cooking, it was also the time for preparing our pan sheets or the papers. As you can see on the left, this machine is a rapid hand sheet warmer. So here on the left, you have a, like a vacuum tower with a friction system. And then on the right is a, like a drawing. So this machine is preparing the samples and the hand sheets that, so normally this machine is a paper machine, which is in the paper mill, but this is what, uh, like in the super, super smaller size, and it's only using for the laboratory devices. It's one of the laboratory devices, one of the essential for the paper makers and for the paper makers. And uh, as you can see, you just put your whole suspension or solution in this vacuum. Uh, what is happening in mats will be formed on the filtrate. So that we call, uh, that we call it dewatering. And we are moving the mat and we uh, just put it in the dryer, wait for the six minutes. The dryer temperature is 95. Uh, degrees of the Celsius, which uh, is different from US. And uh, we're just waiting for the six or the seven minutes. And after like uh, six minutes, we are removing the paper, we are measuring the weight of the paper. And with, the, with this essential and the basic uh, information, we can calculate the grammage of the paper, which is the, one of the basic and the important information of the paper. So on the right, this is also the pulp dispersion machine that uh, I was using this machine to put all the stock prepared stock. So this one, for example, is only beach and it's just a, just a picture. So it has a, like a 15 liters, again, different to US of the volume, but the, concern, the, the consistency, consistency of the stock was fixed and it was only 0.3%, which is also like the standard to the doing this kind of operation in the laboratory. This is what we have. I just put this picture as a, just an example. As you can see, for example, we have canola with the 10% concentration of the NOH, Anka, and also the ivory, and they were, all of the uh, three of them was the mixture prepared with the 80% of the beach and the 20% of the hemp. And also you can see the grammage and the uh, weight of the samples as well. So after preparing all the samples, this is like the, uh, the real show that what are we looking for? So one of the essential factors in the paper is the mechanical uh, strength properties, as you can see. And this machine is called tensile strength machine is operating with accordance to the Dean ISO 9024 standards. And as you can see, we were preparing the samples uh, with the dimension of the 150 by 50 bits of the millimeters. And uh, as you can see also each mixture and the con uh, consistency was uh, uh, took place and it was just, uh, we took out of the data with the machine but, uh, four times. And the machine needs the grammage and the thickness of the paper to give you proper data. And this is the con uh, operation of the machine, just uh, like a picture to clarify the operation. It would just, uh, pull apart the paper from two sides and the break gonna happen somewhere between these two clamps. And then you have the uh, tensile straight of the paper. The other machine which was used, it was, it's a burst machine. And the burst machine is just put your sample here. And with a clicking on the bottom, you will have a, like a vacuum and a differential pressure actually here. And through the differential pressure, you can uh, calculate I mean, the machine will calculate the burst strength of 
the uh, your paper and why the bursting rate is so important. It's uh, one of the essential factors for the paper and also the uh, board and the packaging, which is right now is in an industry and we are using it like in every day, in our uh, every day and a no normal daily basis all the time. So bears factor and the, start, uh, and the tensile is one of the two factors. For example, if you're uh, ordering something out of the Amazon or you're buying something out of the shops, in the Aldi, in the Costco maybe, you will have with a package. So these packages are have a standards and with the dimension and also like a, they have a, a specifically tensile and a bursting. So they have to prove, they have to reach that a bursting and a tensile to, in order to get to the market. So uh, the other uh, analysis, what, what we've done is by using the FS5 machine, and it's a fiber image analyzed, and you can see on the left side of the picture. So this machine is using like the six sample, and it will give us some specifically nice information, which I will discuss in the like uh, next few slides. So uh, this is uh, the like the most interesting part, and is a result from what we've done in this research. So one of the main things that to differentiate the hemp from the other animal plants is to look at the fibers, and this is like a standard method for doing it to all the, the wooden varieties and also the annual plants. And the, this is what is characterized the hemp and it will differentiate from the other by witnessing the on wood spiral thickness. As you can see in this picture, uh, uh, the spiral thickenings we were just observed in this research, research. This is like the more specifically uh, zoom in picture. The other is the shape and the unique shape of the fiber end, which was also was collected. And the other interesting thing is that the surface markings. So on the, basically on the wooden fibers, it doesn't matter that it's a long fiber or the short fiber, we have a different surface markings, but for the hemp it's quite different and it's quite interesting. And uh, so it makes the hemp, I think it's unique and also, uh, it's easier to, to differentiate the hemp from the other varieties as well. So as you can see, we have uh, two types. They are uh, of the surface markings. Uh, there are crossbars and uh, what we call it dislocations. So on a on car, you can see the dislocations. Uh, uh, sorry, the crossbars. And for example, on a, a canola, you can see the dislocations. So in this picture on the right, the crossbars are like more obvious to observe. So uh, what is the data which is out of uh, FS5? I just put like into the uh, one slide. This is uh, like a long topic and it, we can talk about this uh, all day. So uh, for example, the FS5 give you a vast data out of the uh, analyzing the fiber, which I will show you in the next uh, slide. But for example, we have, uh, I just put like the three Essential, just an example to just uh, get to know to the terminology of the FS5 and what is the reason to do that. So the, to uh, differentiate the characteristic of the fiber in the paper making is super essential. So you have to know that you are working with a short fiber, long fiber, because using the short fiber and the long fiber in the paper industry is uh, like a it's not a, like a, that we are going only for the short fiber or we are going only for a hundred percent long fiber. So in the standard paper and also like the, it depends on a grade of the paper, but normally this is like a mixture. And uh, what is differentiate the hemp to the other manual plants? And I would say to the wooden species is that, so on a hemp, at the same time, you have the long fiber and you have the short fiber. So you can extract the bast, which is the, like the short fiber, and you can extract the herd, which is a, like a long fiber, super long fiber. So just uh, as an example, we have the control length, which is represented uh, as the, LC. Nairman, sorry. Uh, I think herd is a short fiber, right? Uh, the, the best is a long fiber, and herd produced like short fiber. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I just... Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Yep. Uh, so, the, so we have uh, the first is the control length, which is LC. 
is a center line uh, fiber lens measured from the fiber center line. And uh, we have the LCI and the LCA, LCN, which is the lens weighted fiber lens and the arithmetic fiber lens. And you can see also the range as well. So what we have at the first analysis is that the ANCO was showing the uh, best trend in the LCI. And also just take a look at the next graph here. You can see also observed that the ANCO is more or less showing the both uh, LCN and I mean the better result for the LCN and the LCI. So this is what is uh, like a short of uh, data from the FS5 that you can see. And you have uh, uh, lots of information which are like essential for the paper makings. So for example, if we have finds A or the alpha, which is, we call it a flake-like finds or the finds B, which are like uh, lumella shaped uh, finds. And uh, what is happening, uh, you may ask also, what is the F1 range to the F6? So they are uh, a specifically defined range of the uh, distribution of the lens in a whole solution. So for example, if we are just, a, so you said like a lots of uh, data and I just have a, like a short notes as well here. So for example, we have F4 and F4, it means that the, this distribution, as you can see in the both concentration of the cooking, the lens was 1.2 millimeters to two millimeters. And this is just, just like some more specific uh, information for the paper makings purposes, but it's also nice to know. So for example, F1, as an example, again, is the range from the zero to 0 0.2 millimeters. So uh, the other data that we also collected from the FS5 measurement was the fiber width. As you can see, uh, the ivory was showing the, uh, the, uh, the highest fiber width uh, amongst the other uh, two varieties that we were using in this uh, research. And it was surprisingly, surprisingly with the ivory 50%. So and a tensile and the burst, which I already show you the machineries and the test procedures. So this is like the rule of thumb that there is a direct relationship between the fiber lens and the tensile. So if you have more tensile, uh, sorry, if you have more fiber lens, there is more tensile. As you can see in a, the, one of the best uh, improvement that was happening in this uh, research was using with the ANCA with the 80 to 20 percent of the uh, mixture. And on the left hand side, you can observe the tensile, which was increased uh, to more or less uh, nine Newton. And on the right, we have the bursting strength, which is the unit is the kilopascal. And you can see it. Uh, uh, increasing trend in this one also. So uh, this sample on the left side is came from the stock with a 15% NOH concentration and on the right side with the 10% of the concentration. And here we also have the ANCA again with the 70% to 30% of the, uh, with the highest record trend in, the, in this research. Naima, can I ask how many more slides we have? I just, uh, I think it's the end of it. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so. And so this is like a main question that uh, what are these slides have a, like a specific meanings or not? So as you can see in this uh, tensile uh, and a bursting strength for the 100% uh, beach. So if we took and we make a hand sheets out of the beach pulp only, we have this result, which uh, for the R2 samples, for example, and it's just like an example, you can see the 2.5 for the tensile and the maximum of the 21 uh, uh, also for the uh, burst. But uh, this is what happening when you, when we have on the left hand side, when we have the 15, when we have the 80 to 20 um, concentration and a mix uh, stuck with hemp. And it's obvious that we have a, like the increased trend and it was just back to the last slide that you can see that uh, from uh, 2.5, we jump to the nine. So uh, yeah, this is just uh, like a, some short uh, summary and also conclusion from this uh, research. And uh, so as I told you at the beginning of the also the presentation is the tensile and the bursts are the two 
more uh, specifically fact, more important factor in the paper making. And uh, by using the hemp, we saw the increasing trend. So the hemp can be also used as a, one of the stock in the, uh, uh, in the paper and especially in the packaging and the board grades. So uh, as also Arash told you at the beginning of the, uh, this presentation, it was just using them as much as, it was just using the pale and blank, I mean the whole uh, concentration of the hemp with a, a beach, but not using any specific chemical additives. And by using the chemical additives, we can also increase and we can uh, have a more uh, tensile on the burst. For example, one of them is using the retention aid. By using the retention aid, you, uh, retention aid, you will have um, more much fibers on the fiber mat, and your fiber loss will improve. So uh, it could also increase the uh, tensile. And uh, the the other interesting fact about the hemp is that it can be one of the substitutes for and used as an alternative to fiber right now. Uh, which is interestingly, the um, you can harvest uh, hemp uh, as an industrial and for the paper making purposes uh, within seven months of the planting, and you will reach the harvesting. So, if you compare it to the, for example, some varieties like the eucalyptus or the beech or the breech or the maple, maybe, so you will have like a the minimum time for reaching the specifically mature fiber to harvesting the wood is just a, like a minimum time is a 12 years, which surprisingly is quite low compared to the uh, seven months to just like 12 years. And uh, the other issues that the paper industry is dealing with is the amount and the uh, distribution of the CO2 that and uh, with the uh, uh, hemp we also have this ability to absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere, which is making unique. And uh, at the end, I just wanna just uh, specifically point out to the one variety, which is interestingly showed a better uh, and a nicer trend in this uh, research was the Anka, which I think more and more research can be done on that. Yeah, that was all. Thank you, Arash. Uh, that, that, yeah, that, 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 yeah, th thank you so much, Nairman. Sorry, I have to uh, uh, jump to the next uh, presenter very fast. But uh, I want to say is like the result of your research shows like, if I want to summarize it, it's like you added or I call it injected 30% of fiber produced from hemp to other short material, fiber material that you collected from beech tree. Uh, and uh, that increased the quality of the paper you made by uh, 200%, which is great. And I feel like this opportunity gives, you know, the next question is like, and one of the attendees asked, like, can we produce uh, paper from hair? It seems like hair can be a good alternative for the short fiber. And if we are able to increase the quality of the paper produced around the short fiber by injecting a little bit of long fiber from bass, then there is a great opportunity for the industrial sectors to step into this thing. And thank you so much, Nariman, for the information. We are looking forward to continue our collaboration with your university and your research team. And uh, we will uh, generate lots of cool stuff, I think, in the future. So yeah, thanks sure. again. Thank you. Uh, now is the time. I know lots of you have questions. Uh, we will find another time, you know, send your questions to me. I can answer some of the questions by emails. But right now, I want to invite Agrin Daveri, Dr. Daveri, who is an entomologist uh, and IPM uh, program developer. I believe I'm telling that right at Plant Product Company. Uh, I ask her to join us because lots of people have questions, Agrin, about pest management in the hemp field, in the greenhouses and also in the field. So we are not going to specifically talk about pest management and disease management today, but please, uh, in few minutes, tell us about what is the major pests and diseases that we observe in the hemp field and what products are available for growers, specifically for organic growers to use to manage their field? I know it's a tough question. You need hours and hours to answer that question, but 
if you summarize that for us and share some information, it will be great. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, thanks, Arash. I have a few slides with pictures that I can share while I'm talking about the test. Yeah, no so when hemp was first produced in major quantities during the World War II, I believe, the only pest that was really a big concern that causing huge damage was European corn borer. But it's been really, the list has been really expanded. And nowadays, especially in North America, we see all different sort of insect pests associated to a uh, hemp crop. Um, either it's in indoor or outdoor production, which makes the pest management even more difficult when it's an outdoor production, considering a, you know, a different abiotic factor and a higher uh, population dynamic of the pest. But you might think, okay, so where we have pests, we uh, hope that to have the natural predators or parasites of the pest as well. But unfortunately, it's not always the case. I mean, there are out there, there if they are not invasive species, there are predators and parasites that they can you know, take care of them for us, but they are not enough. That's why there are, um, you know, um, ways like, uh, such as, um, you know, augmentative uh, biological control in which we buy and release natural enemies. Uh, and luckily, there are so many different, um, you know, companies, at least in North America, that they, re that they produce and sell um, insect pests uh, who are like, you know, predators or parasitoids to um, the major arthropod pests that we have not only in hemp, but all different crops. So as you can see in this picture, I just listed a few of uh, main uh, insect pests associated to hemp, which are aphids, um, two spotted spider mites, trips, grasshoppers, hemp rusted mites, and lots of different hemitran pests from stink bugs to ligates and all different other bugs that feed on hemp seeds. Um, so the problem in organic or in general in this crop is that uh, there are not many, um, you know, synthetic pesticide registered for this crop due to state laws and regulations. So we are kind of limited in terms of the, you know, control um, tools that we can do in um, outdoor or indoor productions. Uh, one of the major pests that are really, you know, affecting a lot of hemp productions are lepidopteran pests, different species of um, lepidopteran pests. They could be like um, defoliators, the caterpillars that directly feed on the leaves, or they could be different stem borers, um, including cutworms and army worms. And one of the major ones uh, are um, corn ear worms that they kind of um, tunnel through the um, um, buds and kind of um, destroy them entirely. Um, so as I said, for some of these um, insect pests, there are some um, natural enemy commercially available. There are definitely in the nature, but again, they are not in, you know, higher numbers or in right condition everywhere to be able to take care of the pest problem. So there are, you know, um, you know, commercially produced uh, beneficial insects such as lace wings. They could be there like brown or lace wings that I'm sure um, there are available both in Canada and United States. Um, there are also different, you know, flower flies, hover flies, prawns, different parasitoid wasps in particular for aphids. They can be really useful uh, in both indoor and outdoor production. So many different species of lady beetles that both larvae and adults can feed on um, aphids and sometimes trips. Besides these beneficial insects, there are also so many different um, microbial pesticides and biopesticides with fungal or bacterial or virus base that they can also um, be used for insect control in organic, uh, especially in organic uh, uh, production. Uh, not all of them are OMRI certified, but there are a lot of, you know, uh, biopesticides pesticides and the microbial insecticides. And the difference, if you want to know what's the difference really between the microbial pesticide and biopesticide is that the microbial have the microorganism base, which is, could be like fungi, bacteria, or virus. Whereas biopesticides are mostly uh, plant-based um, uh, extracts or essential oils or insect growth regulator. You might have heard of uh, something like as a direct or, um, you know, um, Moltex that they have a uh, neem oil product. They are usually neem oil products based and they are all insect growth regulator that they can, you know, mess with the life cycle of the insect. 
Um, in terms of diseases, there are also some common uh, diseases, at least in this part of the world. Some of them are like more dominant, such as botrytis, powdery mildew, downy mildew, uh, different fungal species associated to damping off and root rot. I know Orange did some research on using um, some, you know, um, Armory certified products to control powdery mildew. Um, Millstop and seeds are some of the good products that are um, mostly used in this, um, you know, production. Um, I just listed a couple of, uh, you know, biopesticides that are available in the market. Not all of them are Armory certified, but I'm sure you can just, you know, explore them more on the internet. Um, but let's let's uh, step back a little bit. I'm not going to be just focusing on uh, solutions for pest control. Uh, what I want to mention, and I'm just going to you know, wrap up my talk with this, is that you because there is no quick knockdown tool uh, such as the synthetic, you know, pesticide. Using all these, you know, beneficial insects and biopesticides only makes sense if you start early. So these have to be part of your growing process, and they have to be a really uh, um, using preventatively because they are none of them are strong enough to kill all your insect pests once there is an outbreak in your field. So the the idea is that you have to not only you know uh, explore um, using these um, biopesticides or beneficial insects, but also consider using all different you know uh, physical or cultural practices um, to be able to kind of put them next together, such as uh, it would be like a different pieces of a puzzle that you can complete the whole pest, uh, pest program with like using different techniques. Um, and that's when integrated pest management really becomes important. Um, it's definitely not a, you know, approach that you can entirely suppress your population. It's more of a decision-making process that you would use to kind of monitor the pest problem and act as is needed. And when I say monitor, hopefully, thank God, there are so many devices in these days. There are so many like traps, such as sticky traps, light traps, pheromone traps that you could set up in your field in order to monitor the pest population and act as it's required. Um, I always say IPM, integrated pest management, is not a tool. It's more of a toolbox that you need to have all different techniques together in there and use them at the right time. Um, so um, I would be happy. I know if you're a little bit short of time here, but I would be happy to answer any questions or any, you know, um, specific questions that you might have about pests or diseases. I'm sure Arash will share my contact information. So uh, yes, talk. yes, we will do that. I, I promise to the education department that in one hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to finish the... But yeah, this is such a broad, you know, um, uh, subject and, and it really needs, yeah. you know, get into the details. <laughs> exactly. And thank you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing these cool information with us. Yeah. Uh, some people yeah. asked for sharing the PowerPoint. It seems like lots of information was uh, in uh, yeah, I just, your, if you are able to PowerPoint. I can come up with a better one for sure. Yeah, OK, then uh, we will send it out through our education department to the people that they need that uh, piece of information. So uh, thank you so much again. I, I want to, at the end, Go, oh, one thing that before we finish the presentation, I want to say is like in August 23rd, 2023, August of this year, we are going to have an event, a specialty crop symposium, first specialty crop symposium at Pocono Organics. Please join us for that day. We will cover, uh, the, uh, we will talk about very special crops like hemp, like saffron, like ginseng. And the good news about that event is uh, Chef Lindsay is going to cook for us. If we talk with saffron, she will cook uh, paella with saffron for us. And we will have her those. Uh, please don't lose that opportunity to join us in that event. So we will have more uh, time to talk with each other about different aspects of, uh, aspects of Specialty Crop Symposium. And at the end, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thanks uh, our sponsors, especially Pocono Organics, Ash, Ashley Walsh, Mike Mooney, and Louis for their support. Many thanks to uh, uh, 
Department of Agriculture, Pennsylvania Department of Ag, and other sponsors that supported us to conduct or research projects at the center. Please send your questions to me. I will try to answer the question as much as I can. So thank you everyone and hope that we see you in the future again. Thanks. <laughs>